raise our hands and love the Lord right now. There's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea. When I'm tossed, it sends out a light that I might clearly see. And the light shines in darkness now will safely lead us home if it wasn't for the lighthouse my ship would sail no more and I church are you thankful there's still an altar are you thankful for the people of God today hallelujah I love you Jesus you first came to God. Hallelujah. You said, Lord, I'll do anything if you just take me in. Thank you. I'm thankful for the Holy Ghost tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the power of God.
God that I feel in this house. Yeah. I can tell you today that your miracle is in the house of the Lord. Yeah. Your deliverance is in the house today. Anything you might need in your life, you serve a big enough God that can meet your needs. It's the very nature of God to make a way out of no way. So when your situation seems hopeless and out of control, God can step into that situation. I'm thankful today to be serving that kind of a God. Yes, hallelujah. If you have your Bibles and would turn to the book of Joshua, chapter number 2. begin reading in verse number 15 down to verse number 21. Then she let them down by a cord through the window for her house was upon the town wall and she dwelt upon the wall and she said unto them get you to the mountain lest the pursuers meet you and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned. And afterward may ye go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in thine house, his blood shall be on our head if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then will we be quit of thine oath which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, According unto your word, so be it. And she sent them away. And they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. Today I'd like to minister on this thought, a thread of hope. Pastor Oman, would you pray? Hallelujah. Thank you. You can be seated. We enter this text when the children of Israel were in a significant time of transition. Everything around them was changing. Their location had changed. No longer were they living in the land of Egypt. They were now transitioning into the land of promise. But between Egypt and their promised land, they were wandering through a desert. Now, I don't know about you today, but wandering through a desert doesn't seem very like very much fun to me. It's hot. It's dry. And I used to live in Florida, and that sand will stick with you for about 17 years. You'll be vacuuming that sand out of your car for the next lifetime. It will, your children will inherit that sand. Just stay away from the sand. Don't do that to yourself. They were sleeping in portable housing. And the only issue with the place they would call home was they hadn't really seen it yet. They had heard of a land that had flowed with milk and honey. But the problem is they haven't tasted of it yet. The enemy had even changed. They were no longer facing Pharaoh and his army because they had been swallowed up by the mighty hand of God at the Red Sea. There was no soldiers, there was no chariots that were chasing after him any longer. Their social status had even changed. They weren't slaves no more. They weren't slaves to the land of Egypt any longer. They weren't beggars anymore. They had a little money in their pocket. They had some gold and some silver. 
Because God told them when they left, he said, borrow gold and borrow silver and take all that you can with you. They had some money in their pocket. They were becoming the head and not the tail as prophesied by Moses and Abraham. God had brought them from a mighty long way. They haven't yet arrived at the promise, but they weren't strapped in the land where they used to be in. They were no longer saved to their former location. Is there anybody in the house today that can relate to that statement and say, I'm not where I'm going yet, but I'm sure not where I used to be? How many is thankful for a God that can bring you out? You may not be the finished product just yet, but hang on just a little while because one day your season is coming. You may not have arrived at your destination, but you're not a slave to your old dwelling place any longer. And the sin that used to bind you is now has no more control over your life. Their leader had now changed. Moses was dead. And this new up-and-comer named Joshua had no real war experience in war. He wasn't battle-tested. He didn't carry a staff. He didn't have a, a sword. He carried a staff. He didn't have a sword. He didn't have the battle knowledge that Moses had. Remember, it was Moses who stood up on the mountain and had his hands raised. And it was Joshua, I believe it was Aaron and her that stood on each side of him. Joshua was out in the battle. He had no real leadership experience to this point. Nor did he possess the experience it would require to build a nation. All he had was faith in his God. And it's at this point we find the children of Israel in their first real test under this new leader. And the first city they had to conquer was a city by the name of Jericho. And Jericho, by sheer geography, was a city that was not easy to conquer. It, had the central, it was nestled between the central mountains on the west and Mount Nebo to the east. The Dead Sea was directly south of Jericho, and to the north of Jericho was more hills and more desert and more sand. And it's just leave the sand alone. And to the north there was desert and hills. Jericho was located in the Jordan Valley, and the Jordan Valley is, as some Bible scholars say, it's the one that the psalmist David was referring to when he said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Some Bible scholars say that the Jordan Valley is that valley. And if these obstacles weren't enough, there were the walls. These walls of Jericho that were 24 feet high and 6 feet wide. These walls that had watch, ta that had watch towers that were 28 feet tall and 30 feet wide. These towers that were able to spot an enemy that would ever try to come their way. Everybody knew that if you was going to try to overthrow Jericho, you had to have a plan and you had to come prepared. Because if the mountains didn't wear you out, and if the desert didn't drain your energy, and if the valley didn't tear you down or break you, then surely the walls would break you to the point of discouragement. Surely the walls, the impenetrable walls, would try to get you to quit and throw in the towel. And here it is that we find ourselves where the Bible says that Joshua sent two spies to try and do to find a way to defeat this city, to try and see if they could spot a weakness in the city's structure. And upon doing so, they would stumble upon a woman by the name of Rahab. Now understand the Bible says that Rahab was a harlot and that she lived on the town wall. And I hope you understand today that people in Bible times lived according to their socioeconomic class. So when the Bible says that she lived on the town wall, she actually lived on the, the wall just outside of the town. And the Bible telling us, is telling us that she had a very unfavorable reputation. Her family was the lowest of the low. You couldn't find much worse than Rahab. She was a marked woman. She was damaged goods, so to speak. She was a woman that society was cruel to. But something happened in her life that would cause her to live in a part of town that was known for trouble. Something caused her to live on the other side of the track, so to speak. Something happened in her life that rocked her world. Maybe her parents got a divorce. Maybe her mom was abusive or her daddy wasn't around. Maybe it was drugs or poor choices, but one thing is certain, that this woman went very, something went very wrong in this woman's life. Something happened to ha had to happen to give her this bad reputation. You don't just lo choose that kind of lifestyle. You don't just wake up one day and say, hey, I want to live a life of prostitution. I want to live a life of beating my children. You don't just wake up to those things. Something traumatic happens in someone's life to pull them down that road. She was spiraling out of control. Things weren't working out for her. But one day, 
as her life was falling apart, she met the people of God. I'm thankful today that when my life was falling apart, he knew where to find me. I'm thankful today that when the landscape of my life was difficult for me to navigate, he still knew how to reach me. Aren't you thankful today that when you didn't know where to go or know what to do, there came a knock on your heart saying, hey, I know where I, I, know where I can send you to. Aren't you thankful that your daddy's reputation didn't scare him away? I'm thankful that regardless of what my mom may have done, he still came knocking on my door. And I'm thankful that even though my life was in shambles, he still knocked on my heart and said, I got a plan for your life. And do you know what her, her response was to the people of God? She said, we heard about you. She said, we heard about your God. The whole city knows who your God is. Can I tell you today that your response to God really matters? She said, we heard about your God. She said, we heard your God can deliver. We heard your God can save, but will he save me? Will your God save my family? I want you to understand today, this city is full of people that have heard of God. This city is full of people that knows who God is. This, people is. this city is full of people that knows where this church is. They've heard of the one God apostolic Jesus named Tongue Talkers. They've heard of Jehovah. They've heard of Jesus. They've heard of one God. They've heard of baptism in Jesus' name. They've heard of living a holy, godly life. And they're just waiting on somebody to come and knock on their door. There's some single mamas and depressed daddies in this city that are waiting on a man or woman of God to share the gospel with them. They've heard about the miracles. They've heard about the deliverance, and they're waiting on somebody to knock on the door of their life. There are still sincere hearts in this city crying out to God. I remember the night that God began to deal with my heart. I said, God, if there's any way you can get me out of my situation, get me out of my situation. And the very next night at work, Living in Venice, Florida, a man came into the restaurant and he said, Son, God wants me to tell you something. I tell you today, there's still people that are praying that prayer right now. God, if you're still alive, God, if you can hear me, God, if I'm not even good enough for you to hear me, will you please do me one favor and change my situation? There are still people in this city that are going to bed every night, crying out to God and waking up every morning to a hopeless life. There's lost loved ones. There's backsliders. The people of God said, Rahab, there's only one way to be saved. There's just one way, Rahab. It's one thing for you to believe. It's one thing for you to know about the people of God. It's one thing for you to know who we are. But there's really only one thing you can do to be saved, Rahab. You have to take this scarlet line. You have to bind it to your window. I'm glad you believe in one God, but you, now you've got to get baptized in Jesus' name. I'm glad you've been baptized. Now you've got to get the Holy Ghost. I'm glad you have the Holy Ghost. Now you've got to live right. You've got to take this sign of scarlet thread and bind it to your window. And when you, See, when you lived on the town wall, understand today that when you lived on the town wall, the windows of your house had bars on them or something that resembled woodwork like lattice. And you'd have to, she would literally have to take her hand and run it around that bar with that scarlet line and with her other hand reach through it and pull that cord through over and over and over again. She would have to reach through the very thing that was keeping her bound. She would have to reach through the very thing that was imprisoning her. She would literally have to reach through those bars and pierce through the thing that was keeping her inside. Bar by bar. With the thread, she would, pull it, she would push it through with one hand, and with the other hand, she would pull it back in over and over again. You know, I'm thankful for a God that can deliver you in one instant of time. But when he doesn't deliver you, that's when you have to do the work. Understand today that when God doesn't deliver you from the needle, that's when you have to walk away from the needle. When God doesn't deliver you from the bottle, that's when you have to walk away from the bottle. And through your obedience, your deliverance will come. I can just imagine Rahab as she tries to get this cord in place into the most visible place possible. She wasn't worried about it matching the decor of her house because her family was at stake. 
She wasn't concerned about it matching her, pla her dwelling place or her living because the fate of her soul was at stake. Her family was held hostage behind these walls of misfortune. And when the city was on lockdown, nobody could go in and nobody could come out. They were stuck. Unless somehow God worked a miracle. Can I tell you today that God still works miracles in people's lives? God is still a miracle-working God. With every reach, she was separating herself from her past. And every time she would try to pull that cord back, she was pulling herself out of her situation. And every time she would push that through another bar, it was farther and farther away from her past until she was all the way complete. With every tug, she was changing her future. With every tug, she was changing her legacy. Can I tell you today that the Hebrew word for line in this passage is pronounced tikwat? And it literally means expectation. It literally means the thing which I long for. In other words, the people of God were saying, Rahab, you might not be much today, but if you will just somehow take and bind this hope, Bind this thing that your soul is longing for to your window. One day things in your life are going to be different. She had come to a place in her life where the only thing that mattered was the salvation of her family. She said, I may have made shipwreck of my life, but I'm not going to miss my moment. I'm going to reach out for hope today. My dreams may have been crushed, but I've just got to believe one more time that he's not going to let me down. Because hope maketh not ashamed. And the shame in your life can be overcome by your hope in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The shame in your life, the guilt in your life can be overcome today by one more trip to an altar. The shame in your life, can, you can walk out of that thing today by just taking one more trip to the altar. I want you to know it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you press in hard enough, you can change your circumstance. You can change your situation. And you can change your life. Your legacy can be changed if you just reach a little bit farther. Can we all stand? Rahab reached this hard enough to pull herself into the lineage of Jesus Christ. Her son was Boaz. You may have heard Boaz. He married a lady named Ruth. She pulled herself up hard enough that she was no longer the person that she used to be. In Matthew chapter 27, the Bible said, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered him unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe from off him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. I just believe today that when they put that scarlet robe on Jesus, you know, you can't have a robe without a thread. I just believe when they put that scarlet robe on Jesus, that he was looking back through the portals of time. great-great-grandmama who said, God, I'm going to make a difference in my life. God, I'm going to make a difference in the life of my children. Jesus. I just believe that he could look back and see his great-great-great-grandma as she was stuck there on that wall reaching through those bars saying, if I just have one shot, 
I'm going to give it everything I have. If I have one opportunity, I'm going to make it with all I got. Because tomorrow isn't promised to no one. And when he said it is finished, I believe he was talking to more than just the people that were in front of him that day. I believe he was looking all the way back and saying, hey, Grandma, you can rest now because salvation has come. I feel like to tell you today that there's somebody in your life that's going to come back home. I feel the prophetic on me right now. Right now there's a backslider being stirred up one more time. Parents, why don't you pray for your kids? If your spouse is lost, why don't you pray one more time? If your mom or dad is lost, why don't you pray one more time? This altar's open. If you've got a lost brother or sister, why don't you cry out to God one more time? If you feel trapped in your situation, like you've gone too far and you've done too much, why don't you give it one more try?